Games, and I am excited to be here for the next hour with you to share Stonemaier Games news, to discuss some random topics, and to um, to answer your questions. If you have any questions about anything, as long as it's not a spoiler thing, I'm happy to talk about it here on the live cast. Speaking of spoilers, what uh, I, I spoiled a little thing last week, last Friday. This wasn't planned. We had I had planned to spoil this on um, on May 31st when we actually made these products available for sale. But we decided, kind of at the last minute, to sell a product at Geekway to the West, which I see Josh is doing us in the comments. The comments, Josh is, it'll be good to see Josh at Geekway to the West uh, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday of this week is Geekway to the West. And we have, mostly Geekway to the West, we just wander around and play a bunch of games with people. We're trying to just have fun with you. But we also have a little booth this year where we're also just trying to have fun with you there, not really sell you on anything, but we'll have a few products there that I think are otherwise maybe a little annoying to ship sometimes. And one of those products is our new promos for Rolling Realms, which again, I wasn't planning to announce until May 31st, but we decided let's sell them at Geekway and then put them on the web store on May 31st. And so let's go ahead and reveal them. Uh, and I see, so Chad, George, Jonathan are here. I see Corey, Susanna. And I'm saying Jonathan's name in particular because Jonathan is the designer of one of those realms. So this is the Tricarian promo realm for Rolling Realms. Thank you, Jonathan, for designing this realm. We also have a Skulk Hollow realm. This is a game from Pencil First Games. Eduardo Baraf contributed to this design. And then we have a Parks realm um, designed by Cameron Art and uh, in collaboration with... Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the publisher of, of this game. Who's the publisher uh, of Parks? Keymaster. Keymaster Games. Also, the biggest surprise, perhaps, is that I hinted at a new way to play Rolling Realm Solo. You can play it using the mini, go mini golf solo mode, campaign mode, in, in the box, which asks for you to use specific realms as you play. You can also just play against me on, on YouTube um, or on Facebook Live. Or... We now have a new way to play in Beyond the Realm of Earth. This is a replayable four chapter solo campaign. So a little mini campaign that uses a variety of different realms. There are a few realms that I think aren't compatible with this, but most realms are compatible with this, this, uh, this solo campaign realm. And you can play in most combinations of realms and you can replay it over and over again. So all four of these will be on our web store on May 31st. And if you happen to be attending Geekway, you can pick them up at our little booth at Geekway and even play the Mac Geekway if you want. I am really excited about Geekway. I see some people here who will be at Geekway, including Susanna. Uh, Corey will be there. Corey's uh, traveling from West Virginia right now. Uh, Josh says he's getting ready to hop on a plane to Geekway. He's meeting up with Corey at Pieces tonight. So if you want to hang out with Josh or Corey, Two of the nicest people you could ever meet. I had a blast meeting them and playing games with them last year. They'll be at Pieces Board Game Bar and Cafe, which is a great place to visit in St. Louis. I know if you're visiting St. Louis this week, you're probably focused on Geekway, but Pieces is a really awesome place to hang out. And Corey and Josh will be there tonight. Um, and yeah, that's, that's uh, they, they made an open invite to anyone who wants to go play games with them tonight at Pieces Board Game Bar and Cafe. Uh yeah, so that's that's this week. Geekway is is the main focus this week. I'm really excited to go there. I usually go to Geekway. I usually like eat an early lunch before Geekway, and then I head over to Geekway, which is out in St. Charles, which is about 30 minutes away from where I live. Um, and then I hang out there for around six or seven hours until I start to get tired and hungry, and then I head out and go home and have a qu nice, quiet dinner and unwind. That is uh, how I spend most days at Geekway. That's what I'll do Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Sunday, I'm still kind of thinking about maybe doing a disc golf thing if anyone wants to play. I need to look up courses that are out near St. Charles because I do usually don't play that far away. But it's on my mind that I might play there. And if you are going to Geekway and you're watching this um, and you haven't already heard me say this, the way that I approach Geekway is I just wander around and look for games that I want to play. I have a long list of games that I that I want to play. Uh, they're, on my, they're posted a few places. If you're curious, I can say them out loud as well. And... Uh, I think that's a good, I, I would actually recommend that approach to anyone who wants to play games in Geekway. Although it's also totally fine if you settle down at a certain table and just play games mostly there. But the thing that I would recommend against ever so slightly is scheduling games at certain times. I know some people like to do that. I get it. But what will end up happening if you do that is you'll end up often waiting. So if you schedule a game with a, a certain combination of people at a certain time, 
odds are you're going to end up waiting for some of those people to arrive at that time. So you'll end up just hanging out, waiting, not doing anything while you're waiting for them. And you'll also, if you're playing a game before that, you'll feel pressure to finish the game faster than you would otherwise because you have this thing scheduled in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> so I just watch out for that a little bit. Because it can end up being a little bit more of a burden than perhaps you intend. <clears throat> uh, I think the best time to schedule anything is the first game of the day. That's one that you can schedule. Can schedule that one and then just go with the flow for the rest of the day. That's my little tip from attending about 10 geek ways at this point. Uh, Josh asked about the disc golf possibility of playing some disc golf on Sunday. Yeah, Josh is kind of up in the air right now. I need to have some way to coordinate this, but uh, maybe I'll just give my number out to people who I run into at Geekway like you, Josh, if, uh, if it's something that I'm going to think about doing on Sunday. Because um, I, I would like anyone who's interested in playing it, it would be nice to get some fresh air. It's also weather dependent a little bit, so that's a factor. And I also don't want to pick a particularly long course because I know some people will want to get back to Geekway to play some games there. Uh, what else do I have about Geekway? Anything else? Um, yeah, you know, I'll read off the games real quick that I don't that I haven't heard of people like bringing or um, or necessarily wanting to play yet. Yet, but these are games that I definitely want to play if I have the chance. Um, Heat is one that I I don't have anyone who has mentioned that they have it or or want to play it with me, but I'd love to play Heat. I'd love to try that for the first time. What else is on here? Four Humors. I think it's pretty hard to get. It would have to be someone probably specifically bringing that. The game Claim, uh, The Great Split, and Space Station Phoenix are the games that kind of are on the top of my list. I have others as well. Some that have people already attached to them, some that I know friends locally own, and some that are in the play and win. Uh, Space Station Phoenix is in the play and win, so that one is accessible. I just need someone who knows how to play that one. Chet says he's been playing the new Zelda game, Tears of the Kingdom. I've been watching a lot of videos about Tears of the Kingdom because I'm very curious about the new mechanisms and new areas you can explore in Tears of the Kingdom. Uh, Chet says, I know you were curious about it for the, for the board game you're designing. I, yeah, I'm still working on an open world game that I started designing when the original Zelda came out. It was a big inspi inspiration for me. And now I took so long that they designed a whole giant other game in the Zelda series. And Chet says, it's an amazing game. Some really cool new mechanisms. Uh, focusing on fusing items to make better items. Um, yeah, that is a really cool mechanism. I've seen that in uh, Role Player Adventures. Role Player Adventures does that, and I, I love that approach in, in Role Player Adventures. Tony's here. Tim is here. I'm looking forward to seeing Tim. I pretty much only get to see Tim at Geekway, so Tim, I'm really excited to play games with you and your wife at Geekway if we have the chance. I know I think we're, we are going to have the chance. You're bringing a specific game. Uh, Mosaic, I believe, is the one that Tim's bringing to play. Corey is talking about the Prototype Row event at Geekway, which is on Friday from 6 to 10 in the upstairs ballroom. Hoping people will come check it out and support some aspiring designers. Absolutely. Corey, I hope your game goes over well there. Uh, Trevor says that his friend Charlie is the designer of Four Humors. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, really, I'm looking forward to playing that one, Trevor. That's one that I'd like to try at Geekway if I, if I have the chance. What else is going on at Stonemaier Games? So we have some restocks, and you probably have gotten a notification about this if, if uh, you are in an area where these restocks have happened. Uh, the leg Scythe Legendary Box is now back in stock. The Ruling Realms Upgrade Kit is back in stock. Wingspan Asia, back in stock. And Between Two Cities Essential Edition, back in stock. In all regions except Europe, the European shipment is scheduled to arrive on May 31st. So you'll be able to get anything of any of those items at the same time as you get the new Rolling Realms promos, if you'd like. Um, plus one other product that I haven't talked about yet. We have one other product for May 31st. So that'll be a, a big, after April, uh, May May 1st was kind of a nothing. We weren't really offering anything special for sale, but we do have some stuff coming out on May 31st. Um, also, I do have word that the nesting box, the third printing of the nesting box, and the latest printing, I think it's the fourth printing, of the Scythe Metal Mechs, and the silicon base snaps for those metal mechs are incoming. Um, I don't know exactly when they'll arrive, but I think we're probably looking at um, at late June, early July for those items is, is my current estimate. That could change, but I, I do know that they are incoming. What else is going on? Um, I do have a question of the day here, but I'll, I'll look over at comments real quick. Uh, sorry, Blake, did I say Rolling Realms upgrade kit? I said Red I said Rolling Realms. Red Rising upgrade kit. Rolling Realms is, is the way it is already. I was talking about the promos. The Red Rising upgrade kit is the one that takes a standard version of Red Rising and adds uh, the gold foil cards 
and I believe the card holders are included in it, and the metal tokens, the metal metal cubes, and other a few other metal tokens included in the game. So that is the upgrade kit. Red Rising, not Rolling Realms. Thanks for correcting that. Um, so I played a game the other day. Uh, Chad's mentioning giant open world game, uh, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. I played a small open world game, a digital game, the other day. I don't play many video games, but I've started polling ambassadors every month to ask them, what video game would you like me to play for a few hours and talk about it on the YouTube channel? Or what game are you just curious about? Um, to kind of help me decide which game to play. Because I, I really don't play many digital games, but I would like to play them from time to time. There's stuff that I can learn from them as a designer. Whenever I play them, I often feel guilty, like I should be spending this time to design games. But I did play one. I played the, the one voted for last month by Ambassadors, A Short Hike, and it was absolutely delightful. This is a small open world game, open world being that you can move wherever you want, but it's confined pretty much to a single island that has a big mountain in the middle. So you're trying to climb up this mountain basically. And it's a very simple game in terms of controls for someone like me who doesn't play a bunch of digital games. It was very easy to control a little bird little bird character that walks around the island and gathers treasure and gathers feathers and, and meets people all along the way and tries to find different ways to move up this mountain. And it was just a delightful game that I played from start to finish in about two, two and a half hours. And I would highly recommend it. If you are, uh, if you play a lot of video games and you're very good at them, I don't know if it would be all that interesting to you, but maybe worth a try. But if you're like me and you don't play many digital games, many video games, um, it was just a very relaxing, serene experience. And yet there was a great amount of um, problem solving in it as well. Because it's, it's a game where you're walking around looking at stuff and trying to find how to get to that stuff. And the game gives you a lot of freedom as to how you can get to those things. It's called A Short Hike. I really, really enjoyed it. I have a video coming out about it this Friday. But I wanted to share that with you because I don't usually play games. And I spent a few hours playing it this past weekend and had a blast with it. Really, really enjoyed A Short Hike. I played it on the Switch. I'm sorry, not the Switch. On Steam. I played it on my PC. I don't have a Switch. Let's see if anyone else has played that. Let me know in the comments if you have also played A Short Hike. Oh, Susanna, oh, well, Susanna says, uh, says, we adore A Short Hike. I, knowing Susanna, I can't tell if that Susanna is talking about hikes themselves or the game itself. Susanna, let me know. Are you talking about the game or just the idea of taking a short hike in general? Um, either way. I think both make for a pleasant experience. Corey says, um, check out Cult of the Lamb. He plays on Switch, but it's on PC as well. I will add that to my potential list for ambassadors to vote on. I, I've heard good things about it. Cult of the Lamb. Thank you for that recommendation. Um, the, one, the one style of game that I think I'll generally stay away from, and this is the one thing that Cult of the Lamb I think has, is any real-time combat. My... Uh, uh, video game like in video games because I'm, I'm such a novice at video games i can't do like those fast twitch responses that uh that, that are needed for a fast combat a real-time combat in video games so if a game has that it's, it's unlikely that i'll i'll play it um but maybe i should try it just to experience what that feels like i, I mean i've played it in the past but that's style of combat but very little of it like the, the type of, the game that I played a lot as a kid was uh, Heroes of Might and Magic, which doesn't have real time combat, as far as I remember. It has you kind of set up combat to happen and then you watch it happen. Foley says, "Yesterday we finished The Rise of Fenris. Thank you for playing The Rise of Fenris. That's awesome, and thank you for finishing it." He says, "We had a blast. The games from Episode Five were crazy. Do you have a favorite episode from the campaign?" Um, I mean, as the co-designer of it, I'm biased about the, the experience. I, I really like a lot of the different episodes and what they do. Um, trying to think, what what would you say is the shortest game in the campaign? I don't mind longer games of Scythe in particular, but I like in campaign games where the games are, are pretty short and snappy, where you can almost play two games back to back. Um, so I'm trying to think of what the shortest game of The Rise of Fenris is, shortest, shortest uh, episode. Um, and it might be episode three, maybe three or four, might be one of the shorter ones. Even though I think episode eight, uh, there are two, a couple of versions of episode eight that you can play. And I think both of them, one of them offers, can be can end quite quickly. Um, not that I, I want an abrupt end to a game um, inherently, but I just, I really like when playing campaign games where you can play two back to back within around two to three hours. I really, really like that. 
Justin says, happy Wednesday. Have you ever set up a game on the table and then for unforeseen circumstances had to pack it up without playing? That's pretty unfortunate. We have a five month old and we're still learning how to, that is still learning how to sleep well. So it happened to us twice recently. It can be frustrating, but I'm happy to, to at least give it a shot even if we don't get to play. That is a wonderful question of the day to ask, Justin. I have one more question of the day to add to that, but I'll ask that to everybody. Have you ever set up a game on the table, been really excited to play, put a lot of effort into setting it up, and then you just didn't get to play it and you had to pack it all back up? And I definitely have had that happen. And I have one particularly memorable, memorable time of that happening, which was um, last year, I think it was last year, I went to Yosemite with, uh, with Megan and her family for a wedding. Um, uh, Megan's a couple people in Megan's family were getting married very small wedding and we spent a lot of the days going on hikes and excursions and there was one day where I decided to stay back at the cabin and relax and brainstorm games I hadn't I hadn't done a lot of brainstorming game design but I was out in nature um, there was a bear that visited me while I was doing this um, I was inside the cabin safe from the bear um, and during this time I decided to learn how to play the firefly board game and to set it up and get it ready to play so I could be prepared. When everyone got back, we could play a board game, a Firefly, the board game. However, they took a lot longer than expected. And so I spent I spent about two hours learning to play Firefly and setting it up because it is a, a beast of a game to set up. There's like 13 different decks to shuffle and a lot of pieces to sort out. So I learned the game. I set it up. I shuffled. took a couple hours. And then they took longer than normal than expected to get back. And... I have no problem with them doing it. They were out in nature and in, in Yosemite having a beautiful day together. I'm glad they did. But when they got back, it was too late. And they got back and we were like, there's just no time to actually play this. And so I either cleaned it up after they got back or maybe I had a text saying they were coming back and I already knew it was too late. So I had to clean up the game. Um, so that was a little unfortunate. And I, I don't want to relearn the game now. I now want to play with someone else who who knows how to play. Because it, it it's, I don't think it's that complicated of a game, but there's just a... a a lot to think about in the game. Um, but yeah, that, that's my experience with setting up a game and not actually getting into play. Beverly says, I have a family member coming to Florida for her grandson's graduation. I bought Wingspan when I was there to visit last fall and she played two games with me and loved it, of course. So this weekend we'll play again and hopefully my grandson will join us. That's wonderful, Beverly. Thank you for sharing Wingspan with others and I'm glad that your, um, your uh, who is it, your grandson's, your family member, uh, enjoyed it with you. I hope your grandson enjoys it with you this time as well. Mike says that he really enjoys the video game Cult of the Lamb. Okay, Susanna clarified both. So <laughs> Susanna does love to hike, but she says her play her kids are replaying the game this week. I'm, Susanna, I'm actually curious if they enjoy it as much when they replay it too. Actually, I'm curious to replay it and just walk a different direction because you kind of walk around this island and I walked clockwise around the island the first time. I wonder how different my experience would be if I walked counterclockwise around the island the second time. Um, I doubt I'll replay it because I've, I've already spent a few hours on it, but it's the type of game where I, I, I kind of hope the designer makes a sequel to it with a slightly different puzzle. Maybe I'm going, maybe you're going down instead of up, going down into the ground because it was just, it was a delight to play. I'm glad you discovered it and enjoyed it with your kids as well. Uh, YX says, can you share your camera and mic setup for your live stream? Yeah, I, I am on a, a desktop PC right now. I have a, this is my mic. It is a Yeti Blue mic. Uh, the set, settings, you can see it on the back here. You can, there's the settings on the mic. The volume set right in the middle. And then my camera is a Logitech HD webcam that's just set up on the top of my, um, my monitor here. I, I don't know. I can't, looking at it, I can't tell what brand of camera it is. Although it's a pretty good camera. I'll look it up because I, I went through multiple cameras before I got to this one. So I'll share, I think I can search for it and find it real quick. Let's see, Logitech. The camera is, here we go. It's a Logitech Brio 4K webcam. Uh, it has noise, uh, actually I don't use the mic on it, so that doesn't matter, but I've, it has HD auto light correction, a wide, wide field of view. Um, yeah a good camera logitech brio brio 4k webcam stacy says that she also loved heroes of might and magic yeah i played that game so much as a kid and i've heard that there's a game what is the game that's been recommended me to a few times that i need to play it is called might and magic clash of heroes i've heard that's kind of a modern quick version of the game to play um, there's also a board game version of heroes of might and magic coming out at some point in the future Zach says, are there any gaming tables that I would recommend? Uh, I think it depends a lot on your budget, Zach. I, I've seen a lot of beautiful tables um, that have very 
wide ranges of budget. The table that I have that I very much enjoy, it's a simple table, but it's it's easy to transport if needed. And although you really do transport your table, I think. But the table that I have is from boardgametables.com, which I think is now called allplay.com. But I think you can look up either one and get to the website. And I have, I believe, the Jasper table from them. It's a covered table. And uh, we actually rarely take the top off now these days, but we could if we wanted to. It's good for campaign games to do that. And it's affordable. I, I think it's, it's expensive, but I think it was around $500, maybe $600. I don't know how much it is now. Yeah. George says he started to look into visa and requirements to plan a trip with his girlfriend to the U.S. sometime in the next one to two years. That's wonderful, George. Looking forward to maybe meeting you in person someday in the future. That would be wonderful, George. If you... Uh, if your trip takes you through St. Louis or you could uh, schedule it around Design Day if you wanted, you'd come here for Design Day, which is usually in September or October. It's a big Stonemeyer event. Uh, but yeah, it'd be wonderful to meet you at some point in the future. Guillaume says the Ruse campaign is coming up in six days. He's so busy for it. Guillaume has talked about this uh, game coming up for Ruse. I mean, hope it goes well, Guillaume. Good luck with your final preparations. Stefan says, Here is Mind Magic 3 is the best video game ever made. Strong feelings from Stefan about that. I can't remember the one that I played the most. I think it was probably 3, but it might have been 4. I don't know. It was it, 3 sounds like the one that I played a bunch, though. Molly says that they're excited for Geekway starting her 12-hour uh, drive tomorrow morning. Molly, I'm so excited to meet you at Geekway. Uh, I've seen you on these live casts on Discord. I know Suzanne is excited to, to hang out with you. Um, and hang out with Carol as well. Um, yeah, it's going to be fun seeing some people from the mill. So if you want to meet Molly or Carol from the mill, they will be at Geekway to the West this week. We're going to play some games together. I think I'm playing Horrified with Molly. Josh says he's been playing Disney Dreamlight Valley, which is essentially Animal Crossing where you're building out your village, but with Disney characters. That sounds adorable. I've never played... Uh, Never played Animal Crossing, but I've heard good things. I've heard it's also a very serene game to play. I'm, I'm betting from your description here that Dreamlight Valley is similar in that aspect. Seems like we're talking about a lot about digital games today, video games. If anyone else is playing video games or digital games, let me know what you're playing. Or even a mobile game, any any digital version of a game. Um, or even on Board Game Arena, a board game port, digital port of a, of a board game. Uh, and again, the question, the other question was, have you ever set up a game to play and then didn't get the chance to play it and had to actually just take it all back down. And I'll throw in one other question. I know we have three questions now bouncing around. Feel free to share your answers. My question of the day is one that I'm pondering for an upcoming blog post. And the question is, uh, I'll ask it two different ways, but if a company, and we'll talk about maybe game publishers, but it could really be any company or creator or service, uh, at some point lost your trust based on something they did. Uh, but they later regained your trust. How did they do it? What did they do to regain your trust? Whether it was a specific act towards you that they did or just a general act related to maybe how they originally lost your trust in the first place. Um, I'm very curious about that because I think it's very hard to build up trust, very easy to lose trust, and really, really hard to regain that trust after you make a really bad impression on someone. Um, I've certainly experienced that myself, both as someone who has lost the trust of people and um, tried to deserve their, their trust again in the future, and also as someone who has, uh, you know, had experiences where people or creators or companies have lost my trust and, uh, and where it's been tough for them to regain that trust, where it's been a slow, ongoing process of me slowly kind of giving them a chance um, and, and them doing things to, to regain that trust. So I'm curious if you have any examples of that that come to mind. I would, I would love to hear about that in the comments below. With the focus being not so much on how they lost your, your trust, because I'm trying to keep this positive and constructive, but more so on how they regained your trust, what they did to regain your trust. Or if you've experienced this yourself as from a, a business perspective, not so much as a, on, a, on a personal level, but from a business perspective, if you have felt that you have lost someone's trust at some point and you found a way to regain that, in a way that was highly respectful of the other person or people or the audience in general. Yeah. Sam says that Burn Cycle has been set up on his table under the leaves for weeks. So that's, you know, a layered gaming table. He says, can't wait for life to slow down a, bit, a little bit for us to get time to jump into it. Um, yeah, I hope, I, I know you've been going through some stuff, Sam, recently. I saw your post on Instagram and uh, really my, my heart goes out to you about about that loss. Uh, it's, it's, uh, 
it's it's really tragic. You've been in my thoughts a lot lately due to that. So I hope you're okay. Um, and even if you're not okay, that's okay too. It's a it's a it's it's a tough time to su suffer that type of loss. Um, I'm not going to say it out loud here in case you don't want to share it, but I, I did want to uh, say that to you. Patrick says in terms of video games that he's playing, he's been playing uh, Tichia, T-C-H-I-A on PS5, but I think it's on Steam too. I've seen some videos about this. It's another kind of open world game. Um, I think Zelda inspired game or Breath of the Wild inspired game. He says it's been a surprisingly delightful game to play with his kids, even though it's single player. We just pass the controller around and solve things together. That's fun. I love that rare game that gathers my family more like a movie. Uh, I love that too. Um, I, I actually really like when Megan plays video games uh, because I don't play a lot of games, but it's fun for me to watch her play. Happened a lot early on in the pandemic, but it hasn't happened in a little, quite some time, really. Um, but one of the things that I love about this game that I've heard is that you can kind of, there's a little character that you control, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, Patrick, but you can also jump into objects and then control that object for a little while. Like you can jump into a beach ball and you can roll around on the beach for a while and do things that maybe as a human you wouldn't be able to do, but in in a, in a certain inanimate object, you can do those things or, or at least find out what you can do through those objects. I think that's a really cool mechanism in that game. Susanna says there are extra achievements in Steam that they like going for in a short hike. So she's talking about the things that you can do in a short hike. And she says, I think the game is peaceful and lovely enough to warrant more than one play, even if it is the same. I, I really am. I'm glad you said that. And I really am tempted to go back and play it. It is so satisfying in a short hike, the game that I played recently, to to fly. Um, it's just really this, it's this slow glide down a mountain. You're not really flying up all that much. You're kind of just gliding down. And sometimes you're aiming for things and sometimes you're just looking around at stuff. It's a really satisfying um, mechanism to experience and really easy to control on my 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 uh my keyboard Corey says that he's also happy with his mevo camera m-e-v-o and his yeti blue mic which is the same mic that i think i have here chad says have i heard the news for the new fantasy fantasy flight trading card game the star wars unlimited uh i have yeah i, I saw a kind of a spoiler post the other day about it although it was a uh, something that they revealed and then i saw someone post about it on board game geek he says, I stay away from TCGs now, but it looks like it's pretty neat. They actually commissioned new art for it too. I actually love the art that they've used in a number of their games for Star Wars. I really like that look of it. But I also like the retro look and feel of Star Wars in general. I love any Star Wars movie in particular or show that embraces that retro look and feel. And that's exactly what they went for in Star Wars Unlimited. So I really do like the art. At first I was like, I don't know if I like this as much, but I, I really like that retro look and feel they were going for on the art. Um, so yeah, I have seen it. I'm curious about it. I, I, I would love to play it a few times and see how it goes. Just as I'm curious about the Lorcana game coming out later this summer, I'm curious to play that if I get the chance. Um, yeah, I'm curious. I, you know, I'll, I'll play any game once or twice to experience it and see how it goes. I don't know if I'm, I, well, I'm definitely not looking to get into a new trading card game. I mostly just, whenever a new magic set comes out, I draft it to see what new mechanisms they're using. Just to have fun with it. I just have fun with a single draft. So I'm kind of hoping for draft options for L Lorcana and for the Star Wars game. Because that, that's my preferred way to play. Uh, let's see. George says, for his trip to the U.S. that he's thinking about over the next one to two years, he's thinking about maybe syncing it with Design Day. He's thinking about going from New York to Washington, Dallas, St. Louis. Lots of stuff to see in the U.S. Um, you could even pick a single city and see a lot of things in that city. Although you could probably get through some of the major points of any city within like two days, probably. Mike says he just started playing the game Humanity, and he says it feels like an updated version of the classic Lemmings video games. Super fun so far. You know, I haven't played, I don't know much about Humanity or Lemmings, Mike. I don't know the context there. I know what a Lemming is and what they're known for. Is, is that the game? Are you steering them, preventing them from steering off a cliff, maybe? Um... Tony says his group played Sulkin last night for the first time in quite a while, and I was reminded of how much I love the game board gear mechanism. I love that mechanism in Sulkin too, Tony. He says, trying to think of another game where the board itself changes or impacts the gameplay in a similar fashion. I know they're out there. There are a few games, not necessarily with gears. Uh, there's one that's kind of on my Geekway list called uh, Hickory... What's it? Hickory... Hickory Dickory 
which has a clock that you're placing workers on and moving those workers on and off the clock. So it kind of uses a gear mechanism where your options are changing throughout the game. I'm curious about that one. Carol is here, another person, person that I'm really looking forward to meeting and playing games with at Geekway. Uh, Carol, we were just talking about that with Molly up above. I'm, posting, I'm pointing down an invisible chat here on my screen here. Uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to meeting you at, at Geekway, Carol. Uh, or not meeting, but uh, I think we have met before, but uh, playing a game with you there. Trevor says, I've been playing uh, Dawncaster a lot more than I should lately. It's a mobile-only deck builder that has a lot of variation on starting cards and growth mechanisms. It's a paid-only game, but it's worth it. Very cool mechanisms. I'll add it to my list. I, I, I love deck builders. I think I, I love seeing um, how many digital and mobile games have embraced deck builders which is you know something that we know as tabletop gamers from dominion on many different games since then and it's been neat to see it's, it's very easy to, to as someone who knows how the core of deck building typically works to play it on a uh, on a digital game okay so donna says so i asked for examples of when a company has lost trust and regained your trust, you in particular, what they've done to regain your trust. Again, with the question focusing not on uh, how the trust was lost, unless it's relevant to your answer, but more so on how they regained their trust. And Donna says that Portal Games lost a lot of people's trust over the Robinson Crusoe GameFound project. Ignacy is trying to regain trust with better communication and more frequent communication. So yeah, that's actually a classic example there. I'll, I'll make a note about that. But um, communication. Uh, how how if you can if you have fallen out of touch with people that you can slowly regain that trust by having more consistent more transparent communication i think that's a great uh, example there i'll make a note about communication here on my list thank you donna josh says a uh, friendly local game store regained his trust by having decent staff after five years since the last time i visited very attentive helping customers as they go in and always ask questions to make the best recommendation that's a kind of selling with empathy there i love that they they improve their staff so so hiring the right people yeah, yeah that's a great example sometimes you can lose trust for a company or an organization or a store because they had the wrong people there or someone that you really did not connect with and um or maybe a, a specific person did something wrong, just objectively wrong, and the, that can lose your trust in that organization. But if they then hire the right people, bring in the right people, that can make a big difference. I like that. Matt says, what mechanism do you find the most difficult to teach? For me, it's trick-taking or trump for someone that has never used this mechanism. It seems very difficult for people to pick up. I don't have any uh, issues with teaching any other mechanisms. Not sure why this one in particular is a struggle. I think in particular, if there's... Uh, a bidding, a bidding with trick taking can, can be tricky to uh, to teach. Um, and I think the common theme map might be any game with hidden information. Trick taking has hidden information. Another example of this would be drafting. Um, if you have drafting with hidden cards, I think drafting is a pretty difficult one to teach because you have hidden information and you're trying to teach things that you can't really show other people unless you want to give up your hidden information. And you're building towards something that doesn't really make sense until you've gotten past a certain point of, of the draft for it to make sense uh like uh seven wonders seven wonders is a great game once you know how to play but it is fairly difficult to teach someone who hasn't played it before um blood rage blood rage uses a so this is in particular drafting a blood rage you really have no idea what you're doing until you get to the first uh post draft uh a part of the game um so you're trying to teach, teach people what choices to make during the draft with hidden information based on important stuff that will happen after the draft so i think drafting and slash hidden information can be fairly difficult to teach um, but once people get it it's very satisfying so kind of a, a, a balance it balances itself out a little bit there Chad says, uh, the jumping into objects mechanism of uh, Tichia sounds a lot like mario odyssey yeah mario odyssey does that as well I love that mechanism, Mario Odyssey. Another game that I haven't played, but I've watched a lot of videos about it because I, I I love seeing open world games and doing different things. David says, how do you deal with burnout from gaming? Oh, I like that question. So many great questions that you're all asking the best questions today. How do you deal with burnout from gaming? Uh, so my personal answer, David, would be that there are certainly times, I play a lot of games. My, a lot of my life it revolves around games. There are certainly times where I'm just not necessarily in the mood to play games. Oftentimes, it's like maybe I'm more in the mood to design games than, than play games at times. Um, or sometimes I just need a little break. Or sometimes it happens with Megan, where maybe I'm really in the mood to play a game, but Megan really isn't in the mood to play it at that time. Uh, but for me personally, when I am feeling maybe a little bit burnt out from playing games and want to do other things, um, I just give myself a little break. 
uh, I it, it often doesn't last long for me. Maybe it's just a couple days, but I'll I'll just I, I just won't won't play games. Um, I'll, I'll do the, the other things that that are more exciting to me at that time. So I think if you are experiencing burnout from gaming, I hope that you give yourself permission to do the other things that uh, that you're hoping to do instead. I think that's totally okay. Um, I think sometimes we can get a little bit of fear of missing out. Like if I have a scheduled game night that I intended to attend and I, I might feel like I'm missing out on, on the things that my friends are experiencing or playing or teaching or just that social time. Um, and there have been a few times I've, I've attended game nights where I wasn't really all that much in the mood for playing games. And I kind of just went into it being like, you know, it's okay if I don't play games tonight. It, it, I can just hang out and have fun. Maybe I can teach a game that I don't actually play. Um, and that, that's been, I think, healthy for me to try as well. Yeah. If anyone has some better answers, though, or better answers for you, I'd love to hear them in the comments. Patrick says in Tichia, yeah, he confirms that you can jump into animals, uh, objects, and even animals. He says, so every jump is a new experience to discover. Cats have night vision. Lanterns can start fires. Oh, that's really clever. I love the, the addition of night vision. That's cool. Josh says that he's looking forward to Disney Lorcana as well. So two big trading card games coming out in the next year. I think the Disney or the Star Wars one won't come out till next year, but the Lorcana one is scheduled for this summer fall. Chad says that uh, Star Wars Unlimited will support drafting. That's great. That's awesome. Joshua says, any plans for an open world story type game coming from Stomar Games? I love your games and love open world games. Yeah, Joshua, yeah, this is something I've been talking about for quite some time. I've been working on a very, very big open world game, a fully cooperative open world game for around six years now. Uh, the original Zelda Breath of the Wild inspired this game, and I've been working on it ever since. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm not going to reveal how the game works at this point, uh, but it is a big cooperative open world game is what I've shared at this point. Marlene says, I've had to miss the last few of these, so it's nice to be able to tune in again. Good to see you, Marlene. She says, her husband and her had a date afternoon last Friday at a friendly local game store to play one of their demo games for the first time. We chose Everdell because I've heard good things about it, and sure enough, I enjoyed it, and now I want to get all the related things. I guess if it doesn't ask for, all, for your money, is it even a real hobby? That's a good way to put it, Marlene. That's a fun way to do a date night, to go to a game store and learn a new game together. Um, to get out of the house. I like the, the intentionality there of getting out of the house and going somewhere. We've done, Megan and I do, do many date nights in the house, but it also feels really good to go out and do something as well. The pandemic has kind of changed how we think about date nights in that way. But I love that you did that. I love that idea of date night. And I'm glad you discovered Everdell. Everdell is a wonderful tableau building game, tableau slash worker placement building game as well. Carol says, what did my shirt say? This is my Thinker Themer shirt. Mondays with Thinker Themer is a little video series that I uh, think or theor themer does on their YouTube channel. Here's another an, an example from Corey about a company losing trust and how they may have regained it. He says the VA hospital and disability compensation side of the VA does not have a good reputation among most of the veteran community. A lot of it is system, systemic or systematic issues due to policymakers being so out of touch. However, it's the frontline individuals that will reestablish that trust. When I interact with veterans or their dependents, my guiding thought is to be the person I needed to be when I was in a similar situation to them. I love that. So I've heard a few answers of using, uh, not using, but being empathetic, empathy, uh, putting yourself in someone else's shoes as the frontline person in their shoes. I really like that, Corey. Um, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for leading uh, in that way. I think that's incredible. Stacy says that her husband is running a demo demos of Oros at Geekway. The entire premise is the changing landscape. So this talks about uh, Tony's question above. Any any games that are kind of like Sulkin, where uh, the 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 board itself is kind of changing throughout the game. The game state is changing throughout the game. So Oros, there's one to play at Geekway, Tony, if you get the chance. Okay, Carol confirms that we've never met in real life. Uh, thank you, Carol. Yeah, I, I see so many faces at Geekway that sometimes I get confused about that. But I'm glad we had the chance to meet in real life and play a game together in real life as well. Carl says, is there any information on the special pack of cards for Wingspan using art from the recent uh, contest? So any uh, any updates about that, Carl? So Carl, we have not quite gone to print with it first. We are in the stages of uh, touching up a few little things here and there. So um, 
I'm uh, right now waiting for I, my, our graphic designer, Corel, who's working on it, has had a busy couple of weeks at his full-time job. So he hasn't been able to work on it in a little bit, but I think very soon we will go to print on that pack. And so we're still looking at end of 2023, maybe early 2024 for the Wingspan fan art pack. YX says, do you think AI art is bad for board game designs, especially how it threatens the livelihood of artists? Um, my approach so far with AI is, is I, at some of our games, we're not using it at all for anything. Um, not chat GB, G, uh, GTP. You can tell I don't even know the acronym. I haven't looked it up. Um, AI art. No, we're, we're working with people. I'm interested in people. I, I'm sure that AI, AI will do some cool things in the future in terms of art and, um, and writing and, and some amazing things. Um, but as a publisher who works with people and the focus is on, on the people and the creative things that their minds create, um, I, I am not interested in AI at all. So I, our focus, at least at Summer Games, is to work with people, not AI. Yeah. Perhaps that's short-sighted. We'll find out if that is the case. But uh, yeah, that's my approach. Carol says, is there anything that you do to prepare for convention when, uh, for a few days prior to it, whether it being gone from work or preparing for what you are doing at the convention. She says, I really started packing last night. You know, because the main convention that I get to is Geekway, and Geekway is here in St. Louis, I don't really do much in advance. If I'm going out of town for a convention, which has been a while since I've done that, I'll often just try to get work done in advance. It's mainly focused on, on work, trying to get stuff done that I can't do at the convention. And also kind of energizing myself up as an introvert. If I'm gonna be going to a convention, full of extroverts, I usually try to kind of take it easy for a few days leading up to that um, to kind of build up that mental and emotional energy. Yeah. Uh, Patrick says, for longer games like this where a mechanism can't click right away, I find it's best to mock a first round, show scoring, and then restart. It does cost time, but it gains more interest long term from players at the table. Patrick, I've heard some, so this is a uh, question about like what game mechanisms or game styles can be a little harder to teach. And I've heard a friend talk about Agricola in this way, how his preferred way to teach Agricola is to play a round of Agricola and then completely reset the board and start over again, which I can definitely see that working for that, for that game. Um, and I really like when games allow this too. When, like, when games are building towards a big thing that you need to know how that big thing works, maybe even in the rules for the game, or how the, like the, the core gameplay loop of the game, start with a little mini version of that. Like the, the very first thing you do in the game might be a little mini version of that thing that you're building up to. So you can see what it feels like, see what it looks like, and then proceed with uh, doing all the things that you need to build up to that, the, to kind of the real version of that. I think games can do that well. Woodstock Games asks, top three marketing things you focus on. Um, I focus on relationships, on people, and on adding value. Um, so I would say those are the top three things. I, 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 I'm not focused on, on selling a product. I'm not focused on promoting a product. I'm focused on uh, engaging with, with people. Um, so I guess relationships and people go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, yeah. And, and really, marketing, I think, is often thought of very limited to, to sales, but sales and selling and kind of advertising that sort of stuff is just one small piece of marketing. Marketing is the entire product creation process, creating a product with the customer in mind, how you can put the customer first. Um, and so taking a customer first approach to marketing, I think, is incredibly important from, from the ground up, from the second you start working on, on a product. Uh, so yeah, those are some of the things. And in terms of adding value, uh, that approach to things is creating content that adds value to other people. Where you're not selling yourself, you're not promoting yourself, but rather the focus is on adding value to other people. Whether it's uh, a YouTube channel, a podcast, a blog, uh, your social media approach, but focus on adding value to other people. That's, I think, the number one thing that I, I do for marketing. There are lots of other things, of course. Uh, I would say my, maybe my third tip is not to limit it to three. Uh, I know it's nice to get a catchy three things, one top thing or top number one thing, but really it's uh, if you really believe in your product that you're working on, um, I think it deserves more than just three. And so I there's, there's many long sections on my blog about marketing um, and I recommend checking them out to, see, to, to read through those articles. And, and see the many different ways that you can approach marketing your product to people. Your product deserves it, I think. So um, take the time and effort to go through a, a bunch of those things and not limit it to three. 
What else is going on at Somewhere Games? Uh, some games I played recently. I played Expeditions actually twice recently. I played it with Megan this weekend, just two players head to head. I played it with a total of five players at Game Night last week. So I have my final copy of Expeditions and I'm having fun playing that just for fun now. And there will be copies at Geekway. We have some special copies that we flew in for Geekway. We're also wrapping up production now. And so it'll start shipping out to fulfillment centers, I think next week. And advanced review copies are being airmailed to reviewers this week and next week as well. So you'll start to see some reviews for the game in mid-June, I believe. And some non-review content even before that. Um, also played Sabacc, the Star Wars universe card game. Uh, we're talking about Star Wars Unlimited here. This is a, a, game, a fictional game in the Star Wars universe that actually has a real-life version of it now. Um, played that just, what was it, last night? Monday night? Played that Monday night. And also played Steam Up. I taught Megan how to play Steam Up this past weekend. I had fun with that. Also mentioned, of course, a short hike. Talked about a lot about digital games today. Um, um, what else is going on? I'm making notes about... Uh, what we've talked about today, so I can list it in the title of this video when I put it on YouTube. Did some blog post about making users awesome. So this is kind of my question of the week last week. What can you, uh, what have you seen companies do to make you feel awesome or to make you awesome? I did a blog post about that with a bunch of examples on Monday. I had a guest post last week from the folks at uh, Navu Games. They have a game on Kickstarter called Raising Robots and they have a post a guest post about a specific software about making cards. And they, they created that guest post and I posted it on the blog on last Thursday. And my video this past weekend was about Tableau building games, one of my new favorite mechanisms, I think, that I'm really embracing. They feel like we're in a golden age of Tableau building games. And so I did a video, a top 10 video about that, that posted on Sunday. I've also done some fun playtesting lately, not stuff that I can talk about yet, some early stage playtesting for certain things, but those playtests have gone surprisingly well, which is wonderful to see. And I talked about the restocks, the things that are back in stock, like the Legendary Box, the Red Rising Upgrade Pack, not Rolling Realms. And soon we will have these Rolling Realms promo packs on our web store on May 31st. And they will be available at Geekway as well in case you want to grab them a little early. Marlene says, she says, when I've lost trust in someone or company, what tends to bring it back is a restoration approach. Um, when they... When they fix or attempt to fix what went wrong and then go beyond just say a refund and add more on top that's especially important if it should be an ongoing relationship because then i can feel a little safer if something else does go wrong that they'll make what they that they'll do what they can to make it right so this is kind of the customer individual customer service level of gaining trust of going over the top um yeah that's that's a great point um, I admire companies. So yeah, I, I think that's great. It's something that we've tried to do that at Stillmeyer Games as well, going over the top, especially on an individual level when we can. And I think it helps. We feel the best about doing that. And not that it's necessarily about how we feel, but we are humans running a company, you know, and I would say that it is easier to do that when a customer is, uh, not, how do I say this, uh, in a, in a productive way, but I think that it, if we are talking about relationships here, if the customer approaches the the company in a constructive, uh, you know, I don't want to put the emphasis on the customer. I can just say that certain customers are easier to work with than others. And like the, the phrase, you catch more flies with honey, that sort of thing uh, is definitely true, I think, at times. We try to treat all customers just as they deserve to be treated, just as well. But every now and then, I just we I get emails from truly irate customers, um, and it is harder to work with those customers, I think, than someone who comes to us and says, like, "Hey, like, I'd love to have this fixed, um, and uh, is there anything you can do?" And, and that's a lot easier to work with than someone that comes in hot. Uh, so yeah, I'm not trying to put the, the impetus back on the customer, but I, I I just wanted to put it out there that I, I think it helps when it goes both ways. When we look at each other as people instead of as uh, a person looking at a, a company of some distant entity. Yeah. Carol says she's curious about the Sabacc game, the Star Wars game. It seems really cool that a game started as a fictional game and then became a reality. And I think there are different versions of the game, Carol. The version I have is the version that was sold on the Galactic Star Cruiser, and it's the uh, Coruscant... Coruscant shift version of the game 
gives you a little more agency in the game over bidding, bluffing, and what's actually in your hand of cards. And it's actually pretty good. It's a pretty good card game, in my opinion. Carol says, did I pre-order the Arc Nova expansion from Capstone? The upgraded action cards look like a neat addition. You know, I have not pre-ordered it, but I need to. I'm glad you gave me that reminder um, to pre-order pre -order that expansion. Or maybe I did. Oh, I hate this with pre-orders. I can never remember if I actually did pre-order it or not. Now I have to figure that out. I think so. Maybe. I'll find out. I'll look through my email. Patrick says, thinking about trust, I was working at GameStop in the era of Xbox 360 where there was a red ring era where many systems were failing. It was very stressful to be working in the video game retail at the time. The thing that solved trust when, was when Microsoft just told stores they could take any returns on the console and get them a new one the moment they walked in the store. Uh, that audio, that probably cost Microsoft a lot of money, but it definitely rebuilt the trust. So they took down, so they kind of, this idea of making users awesome. They made you, uh, made it really easy for you to get the thing that you needed to play the games that you wanted to play. Um, yeah, that's a very specific example. I don't know how to summarize that, so I'm just going to copy and paste here, Patrick. I think that's a great example. Pete's jumping in late here to jump high. Pete, we were talking about trick-taking games earlier and how sometimes they can be difficult to teach because uh, because of the hidden information element of trick taking games, um, especially if there's a bidding element to them, yeah, which I think is it, it can be true at times. What else is going on? So I, I love the conversation about games. Uh, any examples of when someone has taken a lot of effort and time to set up a game and then you just didn't get to play? Um, your thoughts on trust and regaining trust that has been lost by a company have been very helpful today. Uh, I shared earlier that we have some new Rolling Realms promo packs. For parks, we have Skull Hollow, Tricarian, and then the Beyond the Realms replayable four-game solo campaign. Those will be at Geekwood of the West this week, and they'll also be on our web store on May 31st. And I believe the new version, the updated version of the Living Rulebook that includes these uh, new realms is on our website now. I think you can click on that link and see it. I think if I think Carell was going to update it today. Uh, yeah, so those are the main updates today. Actually, I forgot to mention my chocolate of the day. I'm glad Pete's here for this because Pete helps out his wife with their store or her store, Whisk. And Whisk makes some delicious chocolate chip cookies. So my chocolate of the day actually is going to be a chocolate chip cookie from Whisk that I got at the farmer's market from Whisk this past Saturday. So Pete, I'm glad you joined in for that. What is your chocolate of the day or your treat of the day? Anyone watching this now, um, what are you indulging in today if you're indulging in a little something extra, my thing will definitely be chocolate from, from Whisk. Pete says, I find trick-taking surprisingly difficult to teach for people who didn't play, grow up playing them. Yeah, I, I can see that. He, he said, I had heavy gamers stumble with the crew because of the information sharing basic strategy that comes as second nature to people familiar with the genre. And I think, yeah, that's a good point. Good point to keep in mind if you're working on a trick-taking game. How can you make it more accessible to people who have not played a trick-taking game and don't really know what that means? Or maybe have played it and didn't know that they have played a trick-taking game. Marlene says, you're right. It's so much harder to work with people who act like they want to hurt you. That's a good way of putting it, Marlene. That's a more judicious way, I think, than, than how I put it. It's harder to work with people who act like they want to hurt you. It can be especially hard to make amends when the other party doesn't seem, doesn't seem to want to be fair or understanding themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, totally understandable and a good reminder. But yeah, in the end, the impetus is on the publisher, the company, to make things right and uh, try to make the customer happy. The way I think about it is that the customer isn't always right, but the customer is always respected. Um, and so I, I've tried to keep in mind that philosophy that a customer might, might be asking me for something that might be unreasonable, might not be the right solution, but uh, I can listen to them, I can respect them, and I can try to do the what I feel is fair and reasonable to make things right to them. And in many cases, that involves what Marlene says, going over the top, not only fixing it, but also adding a bonus to, to help regain that trust that we've lost with a mistake that we or someone along the supply chain has made, whether it was a packaging mistake, it was a, uh, you know, a fulfillment mistake, things that are just outside of our realm of control, but things that we can try to do better at in the future if we, if we know what mistakes were made. Carol says that her husband made her a homemade key lime sorbet for Mother's Day. So she actually does have a treat today. That sounds delicious, Carol. Well done to your husband for making that. 
Carol, uh, Carol I'll see you uh, this week at Geekway. She's heading back to work now. Chad says he's working on an intermittent fasting diet. It's very different th from than diets that I'm used to. It's going okay so far. How difficult was it for you to change your diet? So my dietary change was to change to a vegetarian diet. And uh, it was easier than I thought, honestly. Um, it was kind of an adventure to find out how can I get these things that I'm used to getting from meat products? How can I get them from, from other types of, of foods as well? So it was kind of a fun challenge. I enjoyed it and I, I enjoyed being adventurous with it. So, but for me, I wasn't really changing. Although I guess the thing that I did change is that I stopped eating a big dinner. I, I now eat a fairly small dinner. I just have like a salad, some nuts and berries and seeds and fruit. And, um, and I have a, my big meal, meal of the day was lunch, is lunch. And so that has been a huge difference. I think that's made a, a huge difference. And that was a, took a little adjusting to. Um, but after doing it for a week or so, I just kind of got used to that being the case. I can see an intermittent fasting diet being a bigger challenge. So that is, that is a, a big break from probably what you're used to doing. And I hope it works out. I hope it goes well for you. And I hope you customize it to make it, to make it work for you so that it feels right for you. All right, I'm going to take off here. It's been a joy to chat with you all today, to, to hear your answers to my questions and to hear your questions, some wonderful questions asked today. I'm going to go check out to see if I have actually pre-ordered the expansion to Arc Nova that I'm hoping to get and play in the near future whenever it comes out. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope you have a great day. I hope to see you at Geekway. If, if you are at Geekway, I'm going to be wandering around, mainly on the main level, I think. Please say hi. Please pull me over. I, I, I may not recognize you. I'm going to go a little face blind because I'm going to see a lot of faces over the next few days. But if you recognize my face or my, st my Stomar shirt, uh, please call me over. I'd love to hang out with you and play a game with you if that's possible. The rest of you who aren't at Geekway, hope you have a great week of gaming. I'll have plenty of music about Geekway coming in the next few days. And uh, I'll at least share the games that I'm playing with you. And yeah, I'll see you next Wednesday. Take care. Bye.